Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Wipro Limited Q2 FY22 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Aparna Ayer, Vice President and Corporate Treasurer. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Stanford. A very warm welcome to our Q2 FI22 earnings call. We will begin the call with business highlights and overview by Thierry, our Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director, followed by financial overview by our CFO, Jatin Dalal. Afterwards, the operator will open the bridge for Q&A with our management team. Before theory starts, let me draw your attention to the fact that during this call, we may make certain forward-looking statements within the meaning of Private Securities Litigation Reform Act 1995. These statements are based on management's current expectations and are associated with uncertainties and risks, which may cause the actual results to differ materially from those expected. The uncertainty and risk factors are explained in our detailed filings with ACC. Wipro does not undertake any obligation to update the forward-looking statements to reflect events and circumstances after the date of filing. The conference call will be archived and a transcript will be made available on our website. Over to you, Thierry. Anna, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really good to be able to speak to you again this quarter, especially uh, as you join us today during the, the festive time. I know that uh, in many parts of India are celebrating Navrati and uh, Durga, uh, uh, Durga Puja. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll make uh, sure uh, not to keep you here for too long, okay? Joining us today on this announcement is my leadership team. So our Chief Human Resource Officer, Saurabh Govil. Chief Financial Officer, Jatin Dalal, and then our Chief Growth Officer, Stephanie Trotman. For me, personally, this is a special earnings call uh, to be able to speak to you from Bangalore. This is my first official visit to the India offices since I took charge in July last year. In the last three, year, three days, I've met with our senior leaders and teams in India, and it's absolutely been incredibly energizing. Your penes and your hospitality I've experienced in India has always been very welcoming. But you can imagine my eagerness and anticipation to meet our teams and see our campuses here. And they did not disappoint. It's been great so far. Of course, I, you know, I've only just started to travel, essential travel, of course. I was in the U.S. last week, meeting with our regional CEOs and GBL leaders, our chief growth officer, and other key leaders of our business. Each of them, I must say, has steered Wipro through a very difficult time during the pandemic. And I'd like to thank every one of our 220,000 colleagues across the world for their commitment, their trust, and their dedication to our customer success despite the challenges of the pandemic. It is very encouraging that over 85% of our employees globally are now vaccinated with the first of the COVID-19 vaccines and over 50% are fully vaccinated with the recommended two doses. In many parts of the world, we are starting to return to our offices in a staggered manner. For example, in India, our fully vaccinated senior colleagues can now come to office twice a week. The return to work will be a careful and gradual process, as you can imagine. We're really keeping the safety of our employees and the needs of our customers in mind as we plan this, right? In the second quarter, I'm happy to share with you that our annual revenue run rate has surpassed the 10 billion mark, the 10 billion dollar mark. It will be interesting for you to note that 2.4 billion of this was added just in the last 12 months. 
This revenue milestone assumes greater significance because we achieved this while undergoing our largest ever internal transformation. Our revenue growth during the quarter was 8.1% in constant currency terms. You may recall this as being well ahead of the top end of our guidance range of 7%. And even if we exclude our two recent acquisitions, that is Capco and Ampion, we grew over 4.6% in constant currency terms. <clears throat> this marks the second consecutive quarter of 4.5% plus growth. It signals the underlying demand and the execution momentum we have generated. And majority of our growth was volume-led. We've experienced secular growth across all markets, all sectors, and global business lines. Our recent acquisitions, too, I must say, have performed ahead of expectations. The demand environment continues to be very strong, and our pipeline is a clear reflection of that. In fact, our pipeline is among the highest in recent quarters. We have a good mix of large and medium-sized deals. There are, in fact, many mid-sized deals and slightly smaller-sized transformation deals in the market right now. This is all good news for us. <clears throat> Our other book, in terms of annual contract value, has jumped 28% in H1. And in terms of TCB, the other book is up 19% year on year. We have strengthened our large deal team and brought in specialized expertise there. So I'm really confident our participation and win rate of deals will accelerate. Let me come to the operating margins now. I'm pleased to share that in Q2, we have sustained Q1 operating margins, adjusted for the one-time gains we had in the last quarter. And frankly, we have maintained our operating margin despite absorbing the full impact of our recent acquisitions of Capco and Ampion, and in spite of investing heavily in our business across sales capabilities and talent. An additional point to note here is that we've also offered a salary increase covering 80% of our colleagues in September 2021, marking a second salary hike in this calendar year. There is significant traction across all our markets, as I said, leading to broad-based growth. Americas and Europe, our top two markets, grew at 15% and 29% year-on-year, respectively, even without the recent acquisitions. In Americas, one, we grew 20% year-on-year, with most of the sectors showing strong growth. Consumer, tech, communications, health, all have grown at 5% plus sequentially. In Americas, two, we grew 31% year-on-year, -year, led by growth in our organic business, as well as benefits from our acquisition of Capco. Most sectors registered healthy growth of 4% plus sequentially. Our European business has delivered a year-on-year -year growth of 48% on the back of several large deals, and thanks to the boost of our acquisition Capco. UK. Benelux Germany led organic growth, growing at 12, 10, and 10 percent respectively in sequential terms. Our apnea market grew moderately at 8 percent year on year. We are now seeing improved traction in Australia and New Zealand, in India, in Japan, and the Southeast Asian markets. The pipeline addition in these markets have been very healthy. Middle East and Africa were weak in Q2, but we are encouraged by the pipeline that is shaping up. Our teams have 
redoubled their focus on our existing clients, and that is leading to strong growth in our top customers. Our top customer grew 29% year-on-year. Our top five customers grew 33% year-on-year. And our top 10 grew 32%. In the last 12 months, we have added four new customers in the more than 100 million bracket. And we have added five more customers in the more than 50 million bracket. This, we feel, is the start of a significant shift. When I meet our customers, they actually tell me they see a change in how our teams approach their business and the value we bring to them. This recognition reflects Wipro's changing mindset and our bold and confident approach to business. Customer satisfaction scores, as measured by an independent survey, has also uh, risen considerably. From a service offering standpoint, our IDS global business line grew 11% sequentially and 37% year-on-year. Most of the sub-practices showed a healthy growth. Our engineering, in, engineering business grew over 25% year-on-year in Q2 and at a compounded quarterly growth rate of over 5% in the last four quarters. Our ICOR global business line grew by 5% sequentially and 18% year-on-year. All of the sub-practices grew in double digits on a year-on-year -year basis. We launched Wipro Full Stride Cloud Services, which integrates our consulting and technology capabilities along with our cloud studio-based assets. This integrated ecosystem positions us as an orchestrator that delivers transformational solutions together with our partners to address our client business challenges. The cloud ecosystem, which is about 30% of our revenue, grew 27% plus in the first half. And for the first time ever, our cloud pipeline has crossed $8 billion. And that's <clears throat> reflected in the deals we are winning too. Let me give you a few examples. One, a global software product and cloud services company has awarded Wipro a multi-million dollar contract for product modernization spanning AI, cloud, and cognitive business products. We will leverage our engineering next product pod solutions to rapidly scale and migrate the client's products to cloud. Second, a multinational oil and gas company has selected Wipro to build a cloud-native subsurface data platform which enables consistent API standards for connecting with cloud and software vendors microservices, and proprietary solutions. Working with Wipro Full Stride Cloud Services, the solution significantly reduces subsurface data analytics timelines. I'll do a quick update of our recent acquisitions. With Capco, we continue to build good momentum on our joint go-to-market. The pipeline is building well. And we've started seeing some early wins. We have won 10 deals during first 100 days of transaction closure. Initial days, yes, sure. But I have congratulated the Capco team for leading this from the front. We're also pleased to have completed the acquisition of Ampion, an Australian-based provider of cybersecurity, DevOps, and quality engineering services. This will definitely help us expand our footprint in one of our priority markets. <clears throat> Let me now give you a quick glimpse of how we have transformed ourselves. Apart from, I would say, moving to a simpler and more customer-centric operating model and an organizational restructuring, we have made substantial progress on leadership transformation. I had said that in our previous interaction, that talent will be a critical success factor. So we have worked on two key aspects of leadership overall. One, 
by building a contemporary and diverse senior leadership, including our client-facing global account executives, and two, by moving the leadership closer to clients. Consequently, we have reconstructed our leadership with a good mix of internally promoted talent and lateral hires. 58% of our leadership are in the regional markets, with increased proximity to our customers. Naturally, we will continue to change and hold our momentum, but I'm happy with the pace and the quality of change we have achieved so far. But one of the issues that we must cope with as we build talent at scale is attrition. Our customers, too, are grappling with increased attrition. Wipro acknowledges this changed talent landscape and has adapted quickly to the new world of work. A hybrid work environment is definitely a part of this mix. We have doubled down our fresher intake with 8,150 young colleagues joining us from campus in Q2. We will continue to aggressively build on this, and I'm happy to share that we are well positioned to add over 25,000 freshers in the next financial year. And finally, on to our outlook for the next quarter. We have guided for a revenue growth 2 to 4%, which will translate into a year-on-year -year growth of 27 to 30% in constant currency. To summarize, I would say that the demand environment continues to be strong, and our growth chart over the last few quarters reflects this. It also reflects our improved execution engine. Together with the investments we've made in capabilities and talent over the last nine months, I'm confident we will be able to participate and win at a greater pace. On that note, uh, let me ha hand over to Jatin for his comments on the financials. Jatin, over to you. Thank you very much, Thierry, and good evening, good morning uh, to all participants. I will share some financial details now. As Thierry mentioned, for the first half, our TCV win has been quite healthy at, at 18%, and our, our ACV wins have been 29%. We have we have signed in quarter two nine deals with a TCB of $580 million. Our quarter two revenue growth was 8.1%, which, as you know, is significantly ahead of our guidance range of 5 to 7%, and that reflected in constant currency 28.8% healthy year on year growth. Our operating margins for the quarter were 17.8%, and it was a good sustenance considering the 1% uh, that we received as benefit one-timer in quarter one uh, on sale of our Ensono business. Our tax rate improved compared to last year, where we closed at 22% versus 22.5% of last year. Therefore, our net income increased by 18.9%, in quarter two, and our EPS increased at 23.8% year-on-year. Uh, if you see our cash flow performance, operating cash flow was 81% of our net income. We had $2.7 billion of net cash on the balance sheet and $4.3 billion gross cash on the balance sheet. We had a good realization of 75.11 at the end of the quarter and we had $3.3 billion of forex hedges. We have guided, as theory articulated, 2 to 4% sequentially, and the constant currency exchange rates are mentioned in our press release, and we'll be very happy to take your questions from here. Thank you. Uh, shall we open up for Q&A? Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star, then one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star, then two. 
participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who wishes to ask questions, please press star then 1. The first question is from the line of Devya Nagarajan from UBS. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, congrats on the strong quarter and uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, just a couple of things. I think uh, if you were to kind of rate how you've seen the progress of your strategy in the last few months and separate it out from bottom up strategic gains versus the overall demand bounce that we're seeing right now, where would you put the contribution of either? And in terms of um, the strategic path and the route that you would like to take, how far do you think the organization has reached and what is left to be done? So, I, I, so you, Divya, uh, this is Jatin. You know, if you don't mind, can you repeat your question? Your, your line was slightly blurred. We couldn't follow your question. Okay, uh, so I, my question basically was that how much of um, the growth right now would you attribute to your bottom-up strategic initiatives and the results that they are producing? And how much would you basically say it's, it's the demand lift that you're getting because of what's happened overall uh, to digital? Um, okay. And my, the second part of that question is that uh, from, a, from a strategy point of view, what is actually the progress? and in terms of the milestones that we've been tracking and what is left to be done. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Divya, I'll try to respond to the, to the two points. Uh, the first one is a difficult one, obviously. You know, it's difficult to, to uh, disconnect, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the impact of a market uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, what's more specific to Wipro itself. I think there is a real adequation between a uh, good market and an organization that is very aligned to the priorities of our clients. And so the bottom line is that, yes, we are benefiting for, from a good market. We are seeing that the market continues to be good, and if not continue to get better. But we are also seeing that we are having a better impact with our clients, that we are having a better impact and that we are actually performing better uh, on the deals we are going after. And so I think at the end of the day, I cannot split uh, 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 scientifically, but there is no question that, you know, this performance is the result of the, the performance of uh, Wipro in a good market. The second point uh, around the uh, impact of our strategy. Uh, the strategy that we had laid out, Divya, about 15 months ago now was, one, a strategy of obsessive focus on growth. And that's what we've done by, you know, ha allowing our teams to focus the time for the clients in the market. We've simplified the model. We've simplified the organization. We have... Um, uh, reinforced our uh, internal processes so that people can have more time for the market, spend more time with the clients. We have adjusted our ambition and, and, and really redefined where we felt we wanted to, to, to play with our um, clients and really be their partner in their transformation. And this is what we've been doing you know, day after day. And then two more things or three more things. We have been very clear on the fact that, you know, we wanted to focus our investments around our top accounts. That's what we've done. And the result is that, you know, what you're seeing today is that we've increased significantly the number of deals over 100, of account over $100 million. We've increased the number of account over $75 million or over $50 million. So, We've increased the size of our large account. Those accounts have been growth engine for us. Uh, we have we had been clear on the fact that we wanted to uh, further invest and bet big on the, the 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 power of developing partnership with 
technology companies uh, like AWS, Microsoft, Google or, or SAP, and this is what we've been, or ServiceNow, this is what we've been doing. And here also we've been getting uh, remarkable growth over the last uh, quarters. And finally, uh, we have a strategy to uh, go after a big deal as well. And that's, you know, with that in mind that we've, uh, you know, organized our big deal team around our chief growth officer, Stephanie. And so I would say that when you look at um, the way we have the, uh, built, if I can say, if we, the way we have produced this growth, it's fully aligned to the, it's the absolute result of the strategy we've been driving over the last 15 months. Nagarajan, do you have any further questions? Yeah, just to follow up to that, um, you had earlier spoken about um, the chief growth office driving the large deal engine and um, how it was nearly complete. Uh, given that we've had a little bit of a slowdown in PCV in the last couple of quarters, I appreciate the ACV has gone up, but uh, in terms of total deal value, are you happy with where it is right now? And what should we expect? in terms of uh, the deal trends going forward uh, from your initiative? I'll, I'll, I'll take it a little bit and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask Stephanie to, to build on it. Uh, for sure, we are happy with the performance in bookings. I mean, the quality of the uh, deals we've closed uh, this quarter um, with, our client, with our top clients, uh, a good mix of, you know, large and, and mid-sized deals. There's a good volume of uh, activity that is fueling this, this growth. We didn't have a mega deal this quarter, and you know we, we, we knew it. So you know it's not like you you are turning a, an opportunity into an opportunity into a mega deal in a few months' time. Those deals typically take more time. Uh, what we've done is geared up, geared up the, eng the engine, the big deal team, to start to produce more opportunities in our pipeline. Uh, for the foreseeable future, for the, for the next quarters, and that's absolutely what Stephanie has been doing with, um, you know, bringing in a lot of top talent uh, recently. Stephanie, you want to um, to build on it? Um, yeah, thanks, Thierry. I, from a large deal team perspective, um, you know, in the first few months of building out that team, we've been focused on the current pipeline. So everyone on the team is actively involved in deals. We've seen some clients slow down a bit in their decision making and others who have perhaps broken the opportunities into smaller opportunities, um, but we're still engaged. Um, and then we've also pivoted towards more proactive origination of large opportunities you know, working closely with our existing client base and also our partners uh, to create opportunities as well as respond to opportunities. So I think um, that is what is informing our pipeline moving forward. Absolutely. Thanks, okay. Tiffany. And just to conclude uh, on your point, uh, just facts. Uh, if you, you, you mentioned ACV and TCV, um, DVR. So ACV has jumped 28% year-on-year in H1. TCV has dropped 19% year-on-year. So, you know, from those two uh, uh, aspects, you know, uh, uh, we are growing well as well. Got it. I have multiple follow-ups, but if there's just a sign, I will uh, come back into the queue. Thanks, and wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. We take our next question from the line of Mokul Garg from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Terry, uh, I just wanted to uh, focus a bit on the supply side of the equation. Uh, you know, the demand environment definitely looks uh, very, very favorable, and uh, you guys have been growing ahead of your own expectation. But at some point of time, uh, you know, the, the high attrition uh, and the high, you know, addition of pressures would have uh, some drag on 
the incremental growth opportunities uh, you know which is there in the market uh, do you think you've already started seeing some of that uh, right now or uh, you know is that something which can uh, which can lead to uh, delays in uh, business to a, a quarter down the line uh, you know if the attrition remains this elevated uh, it will be better well, here for mukul uh, i will i will start by answering the fo- the following uh the guidance given for q3 does not assume an improvement of attrition okay so said in different terms if attrition would go down we could potentially do a little better now i frankly don't believe that attrition will imp- or improve if i can say so reduce uh in the next quarters i actually believe that you know given the environment uh we'll continue to face you know the high level of attrition at least in the next 2 3 quarters okay um yes we have uh obviously uh, reacted on the, on it in many ways you you've heard i've mentioned the fact that we have uh uh initiated a new cycle of uh, compensation increase for 80% of our people in September uh but besides that we've also ramped up our you know our freshers strategy and uh you know going for a lot more you know we've revised frankly the level of ambition of our freshers um intake uh to that i i'd like to uh ask you sorab to maybe uh, uh jump in and tell us also from fresher standpoint not only in terms of numbers but also in terms of you know strategy what we've decided to do thanks siri so mukul as you called out you know the demand environment is very strong and uh, supply side we have to work on and the interventions which we are looking at is more long term and is more in depth so it's not only adding numbers or adding more people it's also making sure that how do we make up uh, upskill them and also retain them for a longer period of time so for example for freshers as we go on uh, for through to the campuses this year and we just conclude a national talent hunt and uh, test globe for india uh, where we had more than 200000 people applying for it uh, we are having a communication and a plan which i think is unique where we not only share with them what happens as a compensation when they join but also a plan for them in terms of the career and compensation over the next 5 years and that's built in their contract so it's very clearly driving a plan that we increase the retention of these of these people because we are seeing a high attrition in this 3 to 6 year category and and if we are able to retain these freshers and build right culture in the organization retain them a long period of time is going to long term impact and help us on the supply side so it's a very different shift it's not only about adding numbers it's a very strategic think through that uh, that uh, we will be able to increase the retention of our freshers for a longer period of time and look at both cost and attrition as a long term play here sure uh, thanks uh the uh, the second part of the question uh, was on uh, you know how should we look at the <clears throat> the attrition and and the pricing for uh, you know both uh, traditional or or legacy part of the business as well as uh, you know cloud and and new part of the business uh, the historically uh, the legacy portion has you know obviously been more profitable uh, uh, although growth is not there uh, but you know with with more people getting trained on on new technologies where uh, you know the wages are obviously higher uh, do you think uh, you know higher attrition has started creeping up there as well you know although, although definitely we are getting a significant growth uh from those areas that you are referring to it's true today we are you know Uh, the significant part of our growth is coming from cloud area from uh, uh uh data from you know digital transformation from engineering services from cybersecurity and again this is 
based on this revenue mix that we have, you know, based our assumptions for the gov for the guidance for Q3. But Mukul, just to add to what Thierry is saying, yes, these are hot skills today, and there is a high attrition. So, if I see this is one area where we are working towards, where the upskilling part will help. But it is an area where we have huge demand, and there is a supply and you know skill deficit. So it's it's not about it's just the demand is much more than what we require in the industry. So it's an industry issue which we should look at. Yeah. Uh, so so. To, this is Jatin, just to just to add, uh, you know, Mukul, conceptually, if the demand is high, as Saurabh has mentioned, and there is constrained supply today, if more people get trained in that area, in fact, it will overall reduce the pressure on attrition in that area over a period of time, though that specific individual may be more marketable in the, uh, in, with a new skill set. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you know, I think... Thanks for taking my question. I'll I'll get back into the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Agarwal from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good evening. Thanks for taking my question and congrats on a good quarter. So I have a small question theory that when you see your current client's uh, work progress and execution and the way uh, technology is getting adapted across horizon, what is your sense uh, at what stage of implementation we are? Is it very early stage or do you think that we are somewhere in the middle of it? Uh, so uh, that was one. And second, uh, I wanted to understand that while you say that attrition may not cool off in the next quarter, will it be fair to say that the peak of attrition is behind us? Thank you. So on the first point, which is, you know, you want to understand at which stage of transformation, you know, if you want to think about, you know, uh, uh, the potential that technology can uh, represent for an organization, for a company in terms of, you know, transformation of its ways of working, I think we are, you know, the, 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 the best of the transformation is ahead of us. I mean, the potential of, you know, if you look at cloud, so first of all, if you look at cloud transformation, um, what I'm reading and, you know, is quite consistent here, uh, you know, we probably have touched, say, 20% of the cloud transformation wave. And so the biggest part of it and the largest part of it is ahead of us. If you're looking at, you know, security, you know, there is no question that security will continue to represent you know, budget increase uh, for our clients uh, in, in, in the next years. If you look at data, I mean, data, the way we are leveraging data to drive insight for better decision making is, you know, an immense potential, represent an immense potential for, um, you know, a lot of industries. And here again, uh, the best is ahead of us. Finally, if you look at engineering services, another area is where we are, you know, investing significantly and getting nice growth. We know that this is an area where, you know, in many and across many industries, companies will have to invest in their R&D and will need uh, support from companies like us to um, s support and, you know, augment their uh, R&D, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, investments. And so across all these different areas, the bulk of the transformation is ahead of us. On the attrition, which is your second point, I actually don't believe that the worst of attrition is behind us. I think it will, as I said, it will continue uh, to uh, to possibly increase in the next quarters before uh, uh, cooling down. Again, that's that's at least our assumptions as of today. Okay, thank you. That's that's very helpful. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. <clears throat> thank you. The next question is from the line of Apurva Prasad from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question, uh, uh, Thierry. A uh, couple uh, from my side. Uh, so, how durable uh, is the demand environment, and 
you know is the conversation around scope increase with you know your large customers giving you that confidence of durability of demand and you know the continuity of current growth momentum and i asked this in context of uh, higher acv growth uh, versus tcv growth um so on the first point i mean uh, i would answer a frank yes uh, yes uh, the demand is strong and will remain strong you know just based on the previous points i just covered this so much transformation ahead of us our clients are placing investment in technology as you know among their top priorities to a, to a point apova where it's not anymore a topic for the cio only it's a topic for every cxo in an organization right the cmo is investing more in technology the head of supply chain is investing more in technology the business express strong demand for technology um and obviously all the different functions hr finance operations all are you know uh pushing for you know programs to be uh, developed um so the demand will continue to remain strong got that and and just on this point of yours on strong demand and in context of the current uh, tight supply environment uh, uh, what do you think is the propensity for getting a rate card increase and what part of the portfolio in your opinion is amenable to that increase or is it the case that this is more stable and the benefits are uh, flowing through more by means of greater offshoring and volumes Well, um Apova, I think there's opportunity today. There is opportunities to uh have this discussions with our clients uh in the, this current context. Our clients, you know, uh, uh, our clients feel the same. They are also uh, uh exposed to attrition. They have exactly the same uh phenomenon. And so, you know, I think it's a it's a reality that more important for them today is the ability to continue to drive those programs uh without uh uh you know without uh uh slowing down now from a portfolio standpoint i would say i would still talk about a certain level of stability of the pricing but thank you and all the best thank you thank you Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in this conference call, please limit your questions to one per participant. For any further questions, you may come back for a follow-up. The next question is from the line of Gaurav Kheria from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, congratulations on great performance. Uh, uh, first question for Kheria. Uh, where are we right now uh, in the whole uh, organizational restructuring uh, process? Uh, have you seen any material change in the top 100, top 200 heads as far as the global account executives are concerned? And uh, or or is this something which is ahead of us, and these changes are likely to happen in the coming quarters? Gaurav, excellent question. Thanks for that. Uh, one is uh, in terms of operating uh, model, organization changes. uh we have implemented the new operating model new organization on january 1st and you know uh, we had given ourselves a quarter to stabilize this organization model it's actually been incredibly uh efficient rapidly and frankly i don't want to be overly uh uh, uh optimist i mean uh, positive about it you know every um new model requires a certain Uh, amount of uh, uh, progression but frankly uh very so positively uh surprised by the level of maturity of the model after a few months we have today a model that you know the organization and all our leaders consider is the model that is working and actually delivers the uh upside that we want that we were expecting in terms of you know 
simplicity in terms of you know reducing the number of silos inside the organization, the ability to create a one way pro mindset and getting actually freeing up time for our people to spend more time with customers. The second part of your question, which is about the rotation or if you like the um, evolution of our uh, leadership organization. What I can tell you is uh, we have um, upgraded, if I can say, about 25% of our account executives uh, around the world. Okay, And the second aspect is that if you look at the, our top 200 leaders across the organization, uh, two years ago, we had only 1% of them were account executives. Today, 8% of them are account executives. There is a significant change in the mix of leadership towards client-facing people. Got it. Uh, second question, uh, I'll put it in two parts. One, uh, Thierry, you mentioned a couple of quarters back, one of the key jobs which you had to do was to build the pipeline, actually. Uh, and, and the last few quarters have been good on the conversion. So just I want to understand where are we in this journey uh, in terms of uh, broad basing of our participation in the deal. And uh, the second part of the question is for Jatin with respect to understanding the levers to manage margins in the second half, uh, is it fair to say given the uh, supply environment being tight, margins will, uh, should be lower in the second half compared to first half? Thank you. Okay, so I'll take the first one on the, on the, on the pipeline. Well, you know, we've seen uh, the pipeline progression quarter after quarter. Uh, it's been a consistent progression. The trend has been positive, but more importantly, I would say two things the quality of the pipeline has improved. Uh, we have a pipeline now that is more aligned to our strategy in terms of priorities, in terms of focusing on offerings where we want to invest, um, and also focused around our key accounts. So the, pers the proportion of our pipeline coming from our top accounts is a lot bigger than what it was uh, several quarters ago. So from, from that standpoint, you know, it's all positive. Finally, I would say in terms of deal conversion, I think we are uh, also here seeing a positive trend. Uh, we've uh, improved the way we are uh, qualifying our deals. We've improved the way we are uh, mobilizing the one we pro organization to win these deals. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, the, 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 the laser focus uh, in line with our strategy around accounts and, and specific offerings has allowed us to invest into ca talent, into top capabilities, and this is definitely helping us converting those pipe, this pipeline into deals. On the second question, Jatin? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Thierry. So... Uh, so the answer to the question is yes. Uh, there is there is a, a tremendous, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, competition for great talent, and that means that we need to remain very invested in our talent. We need to make sure that our supply curve uh, is is properly supporting our growth curve, and in fact, ahead of our growth curve. So we are we are capturing every demand that comes in. Uh, for all of that, uh, in terms of impact or a risk on margin, yes, there is a risk on margin, and I think that's not just Wipro, but that's that's the industry fact. Uh, having said that, we we executed, as you know, this quarter well. We we were able to drive operational improvements in realization, uh, utilization, and offshoring, and that covered effectively the impact that we had to take for three months impact on on salary so I think it's going to be it's going to be a growth uh, uh, going forward which will and and how do we balance uh, the effort that we put on our operating levers to be able to cover for the margin is uh, that is going to be a, a balance that we will will have to continue to fight on 
but we have done well, uh, which we are proud of in quarter two. Uh, but uh, there are uh, there are clear investment uh, agenda on talent going forward, which we have to remain cognizant, and that's what we are baking in as we think about second half. Thank you, Jatin. Thank you, Thierry. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equarius Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and I understand and acknowledge the growth of uh, ACV, which is 29%. But if I look at the first half ACV, and even if I assume uh, close to 75% being a new business, and assume a four-year tenure, uh, then the actual new business as a percentage to the uh, the first half sales comes to around 5% as a whole. So does that worry you in terms of the growth profile going forward or do you believe for the industry as a whole the growth profile is changing where we have to look beyond the large deal signings where larger deals are getting converted into smaller deals and there are enough number of less than $30 million deals which will keep your organic growth uh, going forward robust. And second question to Jatin. That is this time, I think EBITDA margin decline is close to 75-80 bits, while right? depreciation savings uh, has been higher than 50 to 70 bits. So what is causing this and whether depreciation will normalize in a going forward basis? Sure. So Sandeep, uh, this is Jatin. I will, I will try and uh, respond to both questions if you are okay. On the first one, uh, you know, there is the, the, the strength of the performance is reflected in quarter two numbers. Uh, it is uh, what we think we can do is reflected in the guidance which we are given. Uh, of course, you can look at uh, look at uh, the the likely performance in many ways, and and you have a, a point of view that that we respect. Uh, but uh, but you must always uh, see that our industry runs on on two fuels. One is the day-to-day -day volumes that we are able to add because we see demand and we fulfill quickly and that adds to our revenue and second is large deals and uh, as you can see the the first engine is is really been very very productive in last nine months and it continues to fire very well uh, and um, we did not have a mega deal as, as theory spoke about it but you know we we have very strong first engine which is firing so we feel comfortable as we speak uh, we feel comfortable that we have pipeline for large deals and that will convert uh, at some point. So overall, we are quite okay uh, and well-placed uh, is the way we uh, see Sandeep. And the second question on EBITDA versus EBIT, you know, we, as you know, we do have certain cycles of amortization related with the specific cost for which that particular item is getting amortized on. And as and when those uh, cycles come to an end uh, in their natural course, the amortization ceases to come in the PNL, and that's reflective of that. And what you see now uh, is is something that can be the basis for your future modeling. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, and all the best. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vibor Singhal from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Vibor Singhal from Philip Capital, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead with the question. Please unmute the line from your side. Yeah, hi. Am I audible? Uh, yes, you yes, Vibor. Yeah, yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, uh, okay, I just had uh, one question uh, uh, from my side. Uh, and my question was pertaining to our strategy and the growth that you see in the European geography. Uh, I mean, we know that the in, uh, Indian companies have done really well in the uh, UK, Scandinavia, and Switzerland geographies. But the continental Europe had something, was a region which I think was, uh, uh, the Indian companies were not able to make so much of inroads uh, due to other reasons of the barrier. Uh, we tried to overcome that over the past year with a lot of local hiring. Uh, how do you see pandemic changing that equation? Has it kind of, uh, as has as it has over the entire world, has it kind of lowered those entry barriers for us uh, as the Indian IT companies and Wipro specifically as well? Uh, do you see more deals coming in through uh, ge geographies like Germany, France, 
uh, are the local European companies like your Stadia, Sofia, Tato Every, and all these guys able to ramp up and give us good enough competition, which they have not been over the past decade. So how is the, uh, the growth trajectory in the European geography looking like with all these factors at play? Look, there's the, my response, uh, Vibo, would have there's two aspects to it. The, the first aspect is there's no doubt that you know uh, companies have learned to work um, with teams that are working remotely. And when you're working remotely, whether you're working two miles away or you know five thousand miles away doesn't change anything. You're working with teams that are not on site. And from that standpoint, right. there's no doubt that, you know, a lot of in the companies across industries in uh, the European market have learned and will be more comfortable leveraging uh, uh, global delivery models, if you like. But the second aspect for me uh, is equally important. In Europe, more than anywhere else, there are major cultural specificities that requires deep understanding of the local markets. And mm -hmm. the local market of Sweden is not the same that the local market in Finland or in Norway. And I think the companies that are you know, doing well are the ones who understand that and who are able to uh, leverage at the same time you know, the power of global organizations and develop a strong local connect. And that's the reason why we have, you know, so significantly invested into local leadership in Europe. And this has been paying off pretty much immediately. Right. So would you say that we are on track with our strategy of that, of what we've done? Uh, you happy with the outcome? Could have been better, uh, or uh, uh, do you think? Do you expect it could be even better in terms of growth rates and in terms of big wins going forward? Oh, you know, my 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 team would tell you that I'm I I, I always uh, uh, consider that we could have done even better. But I think I'm satisfied, broadly satisfied, with the progress we've made, the consistency, the alignment to uh, the plan, uh, the execution, if you like of the strategy uh, and the fact that, you know, we are doing what we have said we would do and that, you know, I like this um, consistency. Got it, got it. Great. Uh, thanks for uh, taking my questions, Kiri, and wish you guys all the best. Thank you, Vibo. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manik Taneja from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity and congratulations for the great execution. Terry, I wanted to pick your brains on a couple of things. Uh, number one thing is around the fact that uh, while we have seen a significant shift in terms of offshore mix of revenues over the last several quarters, we've, uh, that has also uh, uh, played along with significant increase in utilization, which is, which is contrary to what one has uh, seen in the past for the industry. Do you think at some point of time the, the normal tendency around utilization cooling off as more for gets delivered offshore starts playing out? Or you are seeing some some, uh, some different engagement models in, emerge in the industry because of which the offshore utilization rates are holding up quite well? That's question number one. The second question was around the fact that typically second half is much stronger for us versus first half in terms of sequential growth rates. Do we expect something similar to this? to repeat this year as well. Thank you. I mean, so I'll start with the point number two, and I'll come back to the, to the first one after. Uh, uh, the, uh, there's also a little bit of uh, seasonality in, in our industry, for sure. Uh, uh, and that's, you know, that's why, you know, when we talk about sequential growth, uh, we need to uh, take into account seasonality. Uh, the, the, the guidance of 2 to 4 percent growth in sequentially in Q3 takes into account this uh, seasonality. Uh, it remains that if we look at our growth, you know, 2 to 4 percent uh, uh, growth in Q3 would actually represent 27 to 30 percent 
grows year on year, which is quite uh, healthy. On your first point, which is you know trying to identify trends uh, or evolution of onshore and offshore mix, you know, I would be a little cautious with drawing conclusions. I think the reality, uh, Manik, is that you know the mix is a factor of many things. The evolution of the mix depends on the type of deals that you are, you know, uh, uh, selling. Uh, uh, depending the level, of the cycle of where you stand in, um, you know, in the transformation, you're going to need either more, you know, local presence or more offshore presence. And so I think it's not necessarily a a, a trend that is systematic. I think it's a, a, you can see an evolution depending on uh, the. Uh, the mix of uh, deals uh, uh, in a particular sector, in a particular geography. So that's uh, the point I would make. Yes, typically offshore utilization is lower than the utilization we have onshore, and that will certainly remain true uh, even in a market of high demand. Uh, utilization tend to be higher. That's uh, pretty mechanical. With the attrition going up, that also impacts on inflation. And do you think some more things are changing as customers get much more acceptable of uh, of global delivery or offshore delivery? I I believe uh, uh, um, you know you were breaking a little bit, so I hope I understood your question. But you know, uh, if your question was, do you believe that? Clients are more open to offshore. Is it what you're saying? So I was saying, are there more innovative engagement models emerging around offshore delivery as clients get much more acceptable around or get much more uh, uh, are more acceptable of offshore delivery? Yeah, no, no, no doubt. Again, that you know what we've learned over the last uh, 15 months with, through the pandemic is. You know, will change the way uh, the ways of working. Uh, there's no doubt. Um, I would I would leave you with two uh, views. One is uh, we know that uh, a, a significant portion of our employees will spend some days per week working from home, so therefore remotely wherever they live, and it's absolutely the same reality that applies for our clients' employees as well. You know, in every of my interactions with clients, we, we are talking about it, and I think it's a, it's, it's a, a, an evolution of the workforce to last. And the second thing again is that, you know, being more being ex, exposed and having developed the technology that support uh, remote working uh, uh, in a secure way opens new opportunities to clients to think about new operating model and new ways of working with companies like ours. Uh, so yes, for those two reasons, there's no doubt that you know, uh, uh, operating model will continue to trend towards more uh, flexibility between uh, uh, physical and virtual. Sure, thank you and all the best for the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Aparna Ayer for closing comments. Thank you, Stanford, and thank you all for joining us. In case we couldn't take any of your questions, please feel free to reach out to the Investor Relations team. Wish you all a very happy festive season ahead, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Wipro Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you all for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.